Okay, so the rest of the semester, we're basically going to talk about two things. Confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. Okay? And back in Chapter 5, we did confidence intervals, right? Sort of a really basic thing. We did like a proportion plus or minus 1 over root n. Does that ring a bell? That was called the margin of error. So back in Chapter 5, we had the margin of error was 1 over root n. And that was specifically for things like proportions, like the proportion of people who are going to vote in the next election. You ask a sample and then the amount your sample could be off by was given by 1 over root of your sample size. And I think I mentioned that that was called the conservative margin of error. Does that ring a bit of a bell? Which means that this is kind of like a worst case scenario estimate. And we're going to find a better estimate today. Oh, okay. If you want to reference your note as oh, to where it was, was going. My brain's trying to make it the. Like, Sorry, no, chapter five. <laughs> okay. So first of all, let's have some overview. How can we have like a little overview of confidence intervals? So a confidence interval is an interval of values that's computed from sample data, and it's likely to include the unknown value of your population parameter. As in we're pretty sure this population parameter lies between 0.6 and 0.7. That would be a proportion, for example. <coughs> okay, so it's, you're pretty sure it's going to be in there. For example, what is the proportion of the population that suffers from allergies? Like we want to estimate that proportion. I sample your class and I say, how many of you have allergies? And it's like 20. So we'll estimate that it's 0.20 out of 55. And then I could... Assuming you guys were a random sample, I could do a margin, you know, margin of error computation and stuff. Um, I wrote this last year, which tells you how long this election has been going on. Oh my god, okay. Those quite, yeah, so anyhow. You could also do a survey in this class and figure out what proportions support Trump, what proportions support Clinton, and we could also add the other category. But the point is, is that you would get an interval that is likely to contain the true proportion, say, at UAF or something like that. Okay, so some old vocabulary. So blank is the entire collection of units about which we want information. That's the population, population that other P word. So all UAF students. So for example, all UAF students <coughs> or all Alaskans or all U.S. citizens, you know, all people of the world, something like that, okay, everybody. A fixed summary number associated with the population in the context of confidence intervals, this is the unknown thing we want to estimate. It also begins with P. Standard error. Begins with a P. Parameter. There we go. the thing you want to estimate. Some example of parameters are proportions. That was usually a P, right? Another example could be mu, the mean, right? So stuff like that. Those are the parameters. Who are the collection of units that actually get measured? Who's they? Uh, they's the sample. Okay, um, the number of units in the sample, what's that called? Sample, next word's also S. Size. Oh. Right, I'm sorry, that was actually like so easy you thought it was hard, right? Um, what's the letter we usually use for that? N. S is for the sample standard deviation. Yeah. terrible Yeah, yeah, you lost that one. That's why I haven't gone in Japanese. Okay, but you know, number of things <laughs> measured, right? N. Number of N. Oh. Right, that's where. Okay. The summary number is computed for the sample that's used to estimate the parameter. So this is the sample statistic. So if we're talking about proportions, we want to estimate P, and our estimate, the notation for that is P with a hat, exactly. 
if I wanted to estimate the mean mu, what's the sample for the estimate? No. <laughs> you looked at me like, yeah, this is it. This is X drawing. bar. Now, okay, well, if I had the sample standard deviation is sigma, the estimate of sigma is, now it's your turn. S. S. <laughs> there we go. So those are listed in the same order for a reason. You know, P hat estimates P, X bar estimates mu, S estimates sigma. Um, in this chapter, Chapter 10, we're talking about proportions. Like this is all proportions. That's why it says estimating proportions with confidence. Chapter 11, we'll talk about means, okay? So for now, just proportions. Alrighty. In each part of this question, explain whether the proportion that's described is a sample proportion or a population proportion. So remember, sample is a subset and population is everybody. So in the census in 1990, it was found that about one in nine Americans were less than 65 years old at the time. Population. That's the population, because you allegedly asked everybody. So that'd be population proportion. Do we have to write proportion? Oh, I'll probably just tell her to look for the words population. Like, it's okay. Then, and, but just be careful if the question asks you to give the proper, appropriate statistical notation that you do that as well. I didn't ask that, but I'm going to do it just because it might happen. What letter would you use for this proportion? P. P. And it would equal 1 in 9, so 1 out of 9, right? Yeah. Okay. Does that make sense? In a clinical trial done to assess the effectiveness of a new medication for asthma, uh, satisfactory relief from symptoms was experienced by 55% of N equals 80 participants. That's definitely a sample. They didn't give everybody this drug, right? So this is a sample proportion. So would the appropriate notation be P or P hat? P hat, good. And that p hat would be equal to, in this case, 0.55. In general, give your proportions as, like, your p hats and your p's as decimals. I don't care if your confidence intervals are given as percents in the end, and always list both, because percents is definitely what happens more often in real life. The news doesn't give, oh, say, between 0.28 and 0.75. <laughs> like they say, 20-something percent or whatever. Okay. A Gallup poll surveyed a random sample of 439 American teenagers. One question they were asked was, how strict are your parents compared to most of your friends' parents? And of course, your parents are always more strict, right? <laughs> Maybe not. OK, my parents are always more strict. No. <laughs> OK, so the choice more strict was selected by 171 respondents. So what was the population of interest? What is the larger group we care about? The larger group we care about. American teenagers, like all American teenagers. Ugh. So the population is all American teens. What was the population parameter of interest? So that they did talk about like three different parameters, but we were given information about the well, more strict one, right? Mm -hmm. So the population parameter that this question is trying to get you to go for is you care about the population proportion who rate their parents as more strict. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So this is the proportion of American teens who rate their parents as more strict. And then others. Now, what is your sample? How many people did you serve? Mm -hmm. Yep, the N equal 439 American teens who were surveyed. 
notice that um, the sample is everybody who was asked, not just the people who rated their parents as more strict, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then what is the value of the sample statistic? And what's the proper notation? So P hat. P hat, yep. So the proportion who rate their parents as more strict was 171. 171, great, out of 439, okay, which is, I got about 0.39, but could somebody get me one more decimal because I'm just curious. Oh, it was 0 0.3895, which would round up to 3.90 or 3.9. You can leave the zero off, but it does mean that, you know, rounds up to zero, which makes that one go up to, right? You guys don't like it when that happens, I can tell. Mm -hmm. I know, it makes me, fr makes me cranky too. So, okay, so about 49%. Awesome. And you could also have said, or. That's okay too. All righty. So this question is quite related. Oh, this is not related. It's still, but it's still a Gallup poll. So this is just a quick review of how you find a confidence interval when you're given a margin of error. So in this Gallup poll, 57% out of 496 teens who date said they'd been on a date with somebody who was another race or ethnic group. And the margin of error was given as 5%. Find the confidence interval associated with that. So how this would be given in the media is they, like if it was about, say, a poll saying who's going to win the presidential election, they would have given you the proportion, and then they would have put a plus minus their margin of error. Right? They always give both things. Does that make sense? If you look up polls online, they have both of these things. 57 plus or minus 5%. And that tells you between what values your true proportion is likely to lie. So how would you find the lower bound? Subtract five, so that would be 52%. Two, 62%. Isn't that just the, um, the 60? Something confidence interval? 68. Yeah. No. So this is the great question. You guys, okay. So back in, we're going to actually get into that. So back in chapter five, we did our proportion plus or minus one over root n, right? That's what, and your question is a great question. You were like, well, isn't this just the 68%, not 95, because there's not twice this number, right? You think like two standard deviations are needed, right? Is that what the question is? Yeah. Okay, great. It turns out this formula that you learned back in chapter five kind of has the two built into it already. It's already there. But so this is relatable to this to two, two standard deviations. Yeah, so this 95% is kind of like saying two standard deviations away. Yes. Exactly, that's so what it's the, saying. If the standard deviation is already given, or um, the margin of error is already given. If the we, margin of error is already given, we don't need. It's to just worry your proportion plus or minus that margin of error. But if we have to find it on our own, I'm going to do some of those. Okay. okay? So to find it on our own, we're going to learn a formula that is different and more refined than this one. Okay. Does that does that's the idea? Me. But I can also show you that this it is this one at times. Yes. So if we were going to do another standard deviation away, would it be another plus or minus 5% or would we have to do 2.5%? Yes, but it would be plus or minus 2.5%. Yeah, it would be. So that one already has the sort of twice built in already. But most of them, I just wanted to remind you how you find a confidence interval once you've got this whole margin of error business thing. But yeah, you're right. We will need to use the whole two thing to get 95. And it also turns out that the three, three standard deviations away, I mean, that includes almost everybody, right? So you often don't even go that big. You often go like a little bit less than three standard deviations because achieving that much accuracy is like takes a lot of people in your sample. So it's just kind of like computate is expensive if you have to do an experiment, like by surveying people or by giving them drugs, that all costs money, right? So okay. So we'll talk about how to interpret the confidence level and then how to find it. And this kind of ends up being a lot of review from the last chapter. Like it's almost the exact same stuff. So the confidence level, like we had a 95% confidence level in the last example, right? This describes the chance that an interval is going to contain the true population value in, some, in this following sense. 
So most of the time, qualified by that confidence level, as in like 95%, for example, intervals that are computed this way will capture the truth of the population. If we consider all the possibly randomly selected samples of the same size, the confidence level is the fraction or percent for which the confidence interval includes that parameter. So, like if you get your confidence, in, so if you do lots of confidence intervals for samples of size 100, 90, for at 95 percent level, almost all of them, 95 percent, are going to contain the real thing. You have to like repeatedly do it. And our goal is to estimate the population parameter, or at least the range it could be in, because the confidence interval kind of is like a range of plausible values for your population parameter. And we're going to estimate this with a more refined method than that one over root n we use in chapter five. Okay, so for here's the general format for a confidence interval. You take your sample statistic. So in the case of population proportions, this is p hat. plus or minus some multiplier, and this multiplier depends on your confidence interval. If you're looking at a 95% confidence interval, the multiplier is 5%. 2. It was 5% for that previous example, but it's 2, standard deviations, right? If it was a 68% confidence interval, which nobody does, it would be 1 standard deviation. If it was 99.7, it would be 3. Okay, so as your confidence level goes up, that <coughs> multiplier goes up, right? More confidence requires you to cover a wider range. So the multiplier, I'm just gonna call it mult for now. And then standard error, which in this case would be, uh -huh, stand, actually it's standard error of p hat. And why did I use standard error and not standard deviations? This is a question on your take home quiz. Do we, um, all the stuff in chapter nine, we were often given the true proportion, right? We're given P. Because we don't know P, it's called standard error. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. This is the one where it's the, in the equation it was approximately P times mm -hmm. one minus P. Over N. Yes. And then all square rooted, yep. Okay, so here's all this is you're gonna need. So the sample statistic, is the sample proportion denoted by p hat. Okay, for a 95% confidence interval, the appropriate multiplier is 1.96, which is awfully close to two, which is why, so just think use two. 95% confidence interval is two standard deviations, right? It's technically 1.96 standard deviations, but two is good enough. Okay, so just go ahead and use two. And then what was the formula for the standard error of p hat? Do you remember? Does that ring a bell from chapter nine? Okay. And once you've got all those pieces, you can find your confidence interval, which they made you do in chapter nine, right? The only difference is you were given what the true value of P was as opposed to an estimate of P. So in a CNN slash time poll of just over a thousand American adults conducted by telephone, this was designed to measure beliefs about apocalyptic predictions. And one of the results reported was that 59% of the sample said that they believed the world was going to end. Okay? That's what they said. So find the standard error of the sample proportion who believe the world's going to come to an end. First of all, what's p hat? 0.59. What's your n? Good. Okay, awesome. So the standard error of p hat, and I'd like you to use the proper notation because we're also going to have standard error of x bar and stuff, so like right in there what's your standing, standard error in is root. Like we had, it was what p hat, 1 minus p hat over n, right? So that's root 0.59, uh -huh, or 0.41, yep, same thing, all over... 1,003, great. And let's just round things to three decimal places. So four decimal places is 0 0.0155. Does that round up or stay same? Rounds up. 0 0.016 or 
percent. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Calculate a 95% confidence interval for the population proportion. Okay, so we need our sample statistic, plus or minus our multiplier times standard error, right? So our sample statistic was 0.59, yep. Plus or minus, because we're looking at a 95% confidence interval. Two times mm -hmm. 0 0.0, not 0 0.016. Yep. Is that okay for everybody else? <clears throat> and that should make sense. 95% confidence interval means you're two standard deviations away, right? Okay. <laughs> so that's 0.59 plus or minus 0. Point, um, I think that's 0 0.032. Mm -hmm. Or it's 0. 0.558262 oh, sorry, 0. 0.622 or as percents, it's 55.8% to 62.2%. Do you prefer it one way or the other versus decimal or percentage? Uh, no, either one's okay. And I think your, your textbook always gives the decimals as the answer key, but I think the per, I think the percents make a heck of a lot more sense. Do you guys agree with that? So I think it's just probably good to give both. I, but if you if you give one that's correct in your quiz and I don't specify, I won't dock you, right? Okay. Now also interpret this. So one thing when you do your interpretation, you should also they should state your confidence level just so it's clear to the reader that you did this. So the common way to say that is just to say with... 95% confidence. And then we're talking about the proportion of people who believe the world is going to end. It's American adults, that is. The proportion of American adults. Adults does not need to be capitalized there, guys. I, I bad English on you. believe the world will end is between 55.8% and 62.2%. Is it also make sense that the higher this confidence level it is, the more likely it is that you actually have captured the true value. Okay. You're gonna that you're gonna, yeah, you, yeah. Well, when you increase the confidence level, actually your intervals get bigger, and that's because the multiplier is gonna have to get bigger. But you're more sure your value's in there. Oh. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, but you need a bigger margin of error to like ensure that you've got it. You kind of like cast a wider net, so to speak. Think about this as being a net that catches the population proportion. It's gonna catch it more more often if it's wider. But 95% is pretty common, like it's used in lots of stuff. Okay, and on that vein, what determines the width of the interval? Okay, so you have this P hat plus or minus a multiplier, and that multiplier comes from the confidence level, right? Um, times the standard error of P hat, right? That whole formula. The sample size. A larger sample is going to per so if you have two samples and one is larger than the other, how are their confidence intervals going to compare? Who's going to have the smaller confidence interval? The larger, the larger sample. Does that make sense? And that's because the larger sample, the so larger samples produce smaller intervals or narrower intervals because the standard error of a statistic decreases when the sample size increases. Does that make sense? If you have bigger ends, this SE of P hat is going to get smaller, right? Because it has the root, the N on the bottom. Does that make sense? 
Okay, the confidence level. More confidence means you must use a bigger multiplier. So higher confidence levels produce what kind of intervals? Wider intervals. Relative to the same data and like a lower confidence level. And the other thing that happens is the natural variability. So as p hat approaches 0.5, the standard error gets larger. And when p hat equals 0.5 exactly, you get this 1 over root n formula from chapter 5. And if p hat moves away from 0.05, the standard error formula is always a smaller estimate. So this 1 over root n thing from a, at 95% confidence level is always an overestimate or exactly equal. And I want to show you why it's the same thing. So suppose, because it's pretty easy, suppose p hat equals 0.5 exactly. Then this whole, for 95% confidence, the multiplier times standard error of p hat, let's look and see what comes out of that. So for 95% confidence, what's our multiplier? Approximately two. two times the standard error of p hat is 0.5. One minus 0.5 is also 0.5 over n, right? Okay. Well, that's 0.5 times 0.5 is 0.25. So you got 2 times the square root of 0.25 over n. What's the square root of 0.25? Think of 0.25 as a quarter. Yeah, 0.05. The square root of a quarter is a half, right? So 0.25 roots to a half. We've got 2 times a half over root n. I just rooted the top there. And then, I guess I can move it up. What does that make? You see how that had the 2 built into it? Okay, so that's how that 2 was built into that 95% confidence interval for back in Chapter 5. So if you're using that estimate, there's no need to multiply by 2 again because it's already there. So that's kind of cool. And if your p hat moves away from 0.5, then this thing always gives you a bigger margin of error or overkill, so to speak. And I'll show you with an example that that at least holds. So for this guy, suppose that we product a poll and we have 1,000 people. We're going to suppose our p hat is equal to 0.1. Let's compare this 1 over root n to twice the standard error. So this would equal 1 over root of 1,000 which is approximately 0 0.032. And the claim I make is that 1 over root n is bigger than 2 times standard error. Like, that's my claim. And I guess I should say bigger than or equal to. Okay, let's do this one. This is, I'm um, going to be... 2 times the root of what goes in for p hat? 0.1. One. What about 1 minus that? Mm -hmm. Over. Uh huh. That comes out to be about 0 0.019. Does that make sense? So when the proportion goes away from 0.5, the 1 over root n formula is always overkill. So the intervals that we found in like chapter 5, they just ended up being a higher confidence than we had specified. That's all. Does that make sense? And this will always happen that you're always going to have 1 over root n that's bigger than or equal to the standard error estimate. Okay. So suppose that a survey is planned to estimate the proportion of population that's left-handed. The sample data is going to be used to form a confidence interval. Explain which of the following combinations of sample sizes and confidence intervals will give the widest interval, which is likely to give the narrowest. Okay. So here's, before we jump into that, 
the narrowest interval will have the smallest margin of error. Does that make sense? Because you have this p hat plus or minus your multiplier times your standard error. And having a narrow interval means that this number that you plus minus is small, right? The widest interval This will have the largest margin of error. Okay. So one way to make uh, a an interval narrower is to make a bigger sample size, right? Mm -hmm. So your two, I would say your two candidates for narrowest interval would be the drastically larger sample sizes. Do you agree with that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And now look at just those two. Of those two, which of them is going to be wider? 90% confidence or 95% confidence? I'm thinking about which ones? 95% is going to be wider because it's a bigger net. Think bigger net. Right? Wider net. Versus 90, you catch, you're less, like, less certain that your value is going to be in there, right? The reason is, is that 90% corresponds to a lower multiplier. This is two standard deviations away, right? This is less than two standard deviations away. So that multiplier, which usually was is 2 for 95%, is going to be less than 2. So we'll have this standard error thing is going to be the same, right? That's not going to change because they've got the same ends. But the multiplier is bigger for this confidence level. So this one is going to be the narrowest. So he's the narrowest. And the reason is, is that the multiplier is smaller. Okay, and then the widest candidate, so smaller sample sizes, first of all, make things wider, right? And then of those, your interval will be even wider if you want higher confidence. So which of these two is going to be wider or cast the wider net? 95%. That's the wider net. So this one's going to be the widest. Larger multiplier. I think that the net analogy, maybe it's stupid, I think it's a little bit helpful. Higher confidence, wider net. To ensure that your number is within there, you have to make your interval bigger. That's kind of what happens. Okay. So the next section talks about finding confidence intervals specifically. So before this, we only knew how to find a 95% confidence interval, but after this lesson, we can find any percent confidence interval if you want to. The table gives a lot of common ones, okay? But the general form of a confidence interval is going to be your sample statistic, plus or minus some multiplier, times the standard error of your sample statistic. That's the whole really general statement of it. In this case, what is our sample statistic? We're talking about proportions, p hat plus or minus some multiplier times standard error of p hat. In chapter 11, we'll talk about means, and this will be x bar, plus or minus the multiplier, multiplier times standard error of x bar. But for now, it's proportions. And let's think about why these numbers make sense. So 95%, we know that that's about two standard deviations away from the mean, right? So that's why this is about two. Does that make sense? Okay, this last one, is that reason why that number is still less than three? 
What, what confidence level? What confidence level is three standard deviations? Nine Which is more confident than that, right? So that's why this number is a little bit less than three still. Okay, and you can see that higher confidence means bigger multiplier, which means wider interval, right? Okay. So seeing how that grows, though, three standard deviation wouldn't really be three, yeah, it, or ninety-nine point seven wouldn't really hit three, would it? It's an approximation. It's probably just a hair under, just a hair over, kind of like 1.96. wasn't exactly two either, right? Yeah. On your homework, you're allowed to use all the estimates. Like I told the grader when like you're turning it in, like be flexible on how much you're rounding. Because if you use the more specific one, you might get a little bit different answer than me. So if you ever get docked and look at the answer key and you're like awfully close, just come see me and we'll figure it out, okay? Like, but it's just hard to tell her how much tolerance to have. Does that make sense? So in general, I'll show your work, but it can use, and I don't think the answer key is even consistent, it's so annoying. So, you know, it's okay if you use the ORs. I'm going to use the lesser accurate ones because it's good enough. I'll double check. But like I said, she'll be flexible on your rounding. So here we go. So in a CBS New York Times poll done in 2009, the proportion of respondents thought it should be illegal to use a handheld cellular device while driving a car was 0.8. Sorry, I don't have an opinion. The poll sample size was 829. Completely unbiased. Completely unbiased. Mm -hmm. Texting while driving is bad. Don't do it. Okay, moving on. Find the value of the sample proportion and standard error. So sample proportion who think that using cell phones while driving should be illegal. Point, point. Point 0.8. Okay. Standard error. So standard error of P hat. That's not so bad, right? Same formula as before. Root p hat, 1 minus p hat over n. So what's that? 0 0.8? 0 0.2 over 829. Awesome. If somebody was willing to read me four decimal places, we'll talk about how to round it. Three, eight. Okay, so we're going to round things to three decimal places. This is approximately 0 0.014. Students on average really, really hate rounding up. You feel like something must be wrong somehow. I don't know. Okay. Or 1.4%. Okay. Last year I didn't teach chapter nine. This is so much easier when you do chapter nine first. Boy. If you, you can get away without doing it if you're kind of careful, but it was just harder and I will never do it again. Last, there was that snowpocalypse storm last year, remember that? that we, yep. yep. Yeah, okay, that, that threw a wrench in things. So find the 95% confidence interval estimate of the proportion who think it should be illegal. So that's P hat plus or minus the multiplier times the standard error of p hat. So our p hat was 0.8, right? Plus or minus the multiplier, which if we're doing 95% confidence, we're just going to use 2. Standard error is 0.014. Awesome. So that's 0.8 plus or minus... 0 0.028, yep, I don't know why I started writing first. 0 0.028, yep, so, okay, that's 80% minus 2.8%, right? Yeah, I was saying that for the addition it was 0.82. Yep, on the high end it's 0 0.828, on the low end it's 0 0.772. You have to think like 80 take away 2 is 7, 78, right? And then take away 0.8 makes it 77.2. Or as percents, it'd be... 77 plus 2 mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. So there's 95% confidence. Next, we're going to find a 98% confidence interval. What's going to change in the procedure? Multiplier. Just the multiplier. 
Exactly. Change the 2 to 2.33. So 0.8 plus or minus 2.33 times 0 0.014. So I got plus or minus 0.03262. Did you get that also? The reason why you have yep. I'll just round it eventually. Does that make sense? Does it affect the answer at all if you don't round right away? Uh, no, it should be the same if you round now, if you round later. Plus or minus <coughs> 0 0.033. Let's round to three places. So I got... 0 0.767 to 0 0.833 or 76.7% to 83.3%. Was the interval wider or narrower than part B? Yeah. It's wider. Wider. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Okay. And the thing that made it wider was the the, uh, the confidence level and the which, is, which in turn makes the multiplier bigger, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So interval is wider and why? The 98%. I'm going to say just CI for confidence interval because the something in bigger is bigger. The what is bigger? Multiplier, Multiplier is bigger. Okay. Are you modestly curious where those multipliers come from? Like just a little bit? Yeah. Nah, just kidding. <laughs> Okay, did everybody also grab a Z-table, or do you have a Z-table on you someplace? Yeah. Same, one. Same one. Yeah, find your Z-table, and I'll tell you where those numbers come from. And i got to find myself a Z-table, too. If you don't have a Z-table, i got one right here. Okay. So, a couple of conditions, and we'll move on to where those numbers come from. So the conditions for using this confidence interval formula, first of all, if you're going to bother doing this, your sample, is need, your sample needs to be randomly selected from your population. Like, think about all those presidential polls gone wrong when they didn't select a random sample and they predicted the wrong person was going to win. That, and they like published it in newspaper, like Truman versus Dewey, I think, or somebody was one of them. Mm -hmm. And then FDR and somebody they did it like twice, kind of close together. Anyhow. Got yeah, apparently somebody got fired. And then the other condition is both n times p hat and n times 1 minus p hat should be at least 10. And what this number is telling you is the proportion of people that you have with each trait. So p hat is like a percent, right? Like 10% or 5% or something like that. And it's your sample size. You take your sample size times your proportion and it tells you how many people had that trait. Okay, so for example, like suppose I found that p hat was equal to 0 0.3 and I had 100 equal to my n. And suppose that we were talking about left-handed people and right-handed people, for example, okay? Can you reverse engineer how many lefties are in my group? Yeah. 30% of them are lefties, right? Mm -hmm. So how many lefties are in my group out of 100? 30. 30. How many righties? 30. 70. What this condition is saying is that you have to have at least 10 people of each category. Does that make sense what this is telling you? This first category is NP, right? The second one is n times 1 minus p. So if, it's, if something is extremely unlikely? If something is extremely rare, yeah, like apparently having green eyes is super rare. It's like 2% of the population in the world. So I, if I wanted to do some kind of calculations with that, I would need at least 10 green-eyed people in my sample. Mm -hmm. And I can't go, like, pick them out randomly and make sure I have 10. I have to take a random sample and then look for there to be 10 green-eyed people in it. So, Okay. Now where those things come from. 
Okay, so let's just do, well, I'll show you where it comes from for 0.95, 95% confidence, okay? So 95% confidence. So in that bell-shaped curve, what is the total area underneath it? One, exactly, okay. So if you have this bell-shaped curve, and you're looking at 95% confidence, that interval that you get, like this space in here, what's the area under the curve for that part if you're at this level of confidence? Uh, it's 95% it's confidence, so it is two standard deviations, so it's 0.95. Does that make sense? And then the amount in the tails, so the amount down there, and the amount up here, what are each of those? 0 0.025 and 0 0.025, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Your multiplier is the absolute value of what I'm going to call Z star. Z star is just the name I gave it, okay? The star has no meaning other than I just gave it a name. So usually I gave you Z value, you find probability, yes? Now I give you probability, I want you to find Z value. So look in this table, and this massive, massive numbers on the negative side, and look for the number 0.025. It's going to be somewhere in the mess of that middle stuff. Um, it's so 2.24. Point, it needs to be, you're looking for 0.025 in the middle. It should be, it should be 1.96. Okay. So look in the 1.9 row. You see how they're getting close to 0 0.025 there as you go further over? And 0 0.250 exactly happens at negative 1.96. And the absolute value of that number is what they gave you as your exact multiplier. Does that make sense? So it was a reversal of what we did in the past. In the past, I said, oh, I want you to figure out if your Z score is something, what's the P that comes out? This thing, you go on the table and you look at negative, you look for in the mass of P's, where is the one where the P is 0.025? And if you go to negative 1.9 and go over, so you've got 0.25, oh, there. Did you find it? Okay, so go on the negative side to negative 1.9, go over, and you'll see 0.250. Oh. See it there? Okay. How did you get 1 minus 1.96 and 1.9? Oh, 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 that's an absolute value bar. Oh. I'm so sorry. It's just so, it's really hard to make that obvious. Yep. The, the multiplier you use is the absolute value of the negative thing you get. You use a positive multiplier. So now we're looking for the numbers in here. Exactly. Now we're looking for the numbers in here and what Z value gave them. So it's kind of backwards from before. So just for, for, just for practice, okay, when we do one, uh, if we had 90% confidence um, in the tails, so that means my middle area is how much? 0 0.90 instead of 0 0.95, right? How much is in each tail? 0 0.05, 0 0.05 right? Because it's 5%, 0 0.05. So now look in this table. Look for where you see 0 0.05. Or as close as you can get. Four, five, I five, think, five, so I'm in the negative 1.6 row, yeah. and I'm looking for 0.5 exactly, and the closest I get is 0 0.505 and 0 0.495. Do you guys see that? Yeah. Yeah, so pretty much, let's say, well, 1.64 or 1.65, right? Or you could even say, like, 1.645, right? Kind of in between those two. So this is between... Between, was it negative one point, I forgot, six, six, six four, four, 
and negative 1.65, so negative 1.645, right? So the multiplier you use there is 1.64. You just take away the negative sign, that's all. And that kind of corresponds to like, at this level, how many standard deviations away are you? Yeah. So why are we using absolute values now and there was some reason we weren't allowed to use them before or something else? Well, without knowing what the something else is, I can't really answer okay. your question. Okay, from some other point in class. It depends what you're doing, right? Was brought up. You said there was some complicated rule why we couldn't use absolute values. That might have been linear regression. Okay. But it's not, not related to this really at all. Okay. okay. The point is, is just the multiplier is always a positive number. So you just, it's easier to look at the negative side of the table because that is, you don't have to do any kind of complementing kind of stuff. So that's why. But then you just take the absolute value of what you get. So let's look at the next one. So what if you wanted to find a 97% confidence interval? So what is the total, so the curve still has total area one, right? Shaka. Okay, so you want the middle area to be 0 0.97. That leaves, uh-huh, 3% or 1.5% in each tail, which like you said is 0 0.015 and 0 0.015. So look at your table and look for point O one five. Negative two point one seven. Yeah. Negative two point one seven is what I see. Z star equals negative two point one seven. So we're gonna use two point one seven as a multiplier. In other words, 97% confidence corresponds to being 2.17 standard deviations away. Okay, is that all right? Okay, this one's a bit the other direction. What is the confidence level if your multiplier was 1.28? means we found what value in, we looked at negative 1.28 was our Z star thing, right? So 1.28 corresponds to, all right, one, looking at negative 1.28 in the table, I just, I'm sorry, I have to believe myself. Um, I get, I think I get 0 0.1003. Yeah, okay. So I got the P is 0 0.1003, right? So what that tells me, and this picture, the picture is really helpful, I think, uh, even if you can't draw bell curves like me, okay? Tells you that this area down here was 0 0.1003. So what's that area up there? Uh-huh. And so pretending that I could actually draw a curve, your confidence level is the area in the middle, right? Yeah. So the middle area, yep, is one minus just one of those or two, two of them. So one minus um, 0 0.2006 corresponds to 0.7994, I think. Is that right? Okay. Or about, you hate the rounding up, right? But it's going to do it. About 80%. Does that make sense? If you want to be more specific and say 79.94%, right? That's fine too. Is that all right? Wouldn't you have to round it more to... to well, if I was saying, if, yeah, you're right. If I said three decimal places, then this would be the answer. I accidentally wrote yeah. down 0.77. Okay, yeah, I think somebody said 0.77 by accident. It's, it happens. So that's where those Z star multiplier numbers come from, in case you forget them. But you're allowed to, like, write them on your note sheet. Yes? Why did you do that last section? I did, don't know. Oh, okay. 
really, I, the confidence level is often given as a percent. So I'd like you to make this a percent, and it, it's pretty close to 80, right? Or you could say 79.9% confidence, but my suspicion is they were after 80 and then made some rounding stuff. Does that make sense? Sure. I just rounded. Okie dokie. Rounding. Rounding, yay. Statistics class. Rounding. So, another explanation of margin of error. So the difference between the sample proportion and the population proportion is less than the margin of error 95% of the time. So like this is like how much you're off by is less than that margin of error most of the time. Or the difference between the sample proportion and the really apt population proportion. So if you did your p hat minus p, for example, that's also smaller than the margin of error most of the time. In other words, for most samples, about what percent of them, the actual error is likely to be smaller than the margin of error, 95% of them, if that's your confidence level, that is. And occasionally, about 5% of the time, the error that you made might actually be larger, like it just happens, but it's not very likely. One more, then we can go. So suppose the margin of error for a sample percentage is reported to be 5%. What is the probability that, I, I meant to say 3, actually. I don't know why I changed that, so this should say 3%. This is a bad question. I quit this question. <laughs> 